Katie, that was beautiful. Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone, to our second Sunday in Eastertide service. Special welcome to Steve Savage, who has been our member in discernment for several years. Uh, he is a seminary graduate, Andover Newton Theological School. He is about to become the full time associate pastor of First Congregational Church South Portland. I believe that starts early in May. So this will be the last time for a while that we will get to hear Steve preach. I also need to let you know that I will be taking a week off starting Wednesday. So from Wednesday through the following Wednesday, and there will be a guest preacher next Sunday also, Sharon Rankin. Uh, today, I am still on duty, so to speak, and glad to be here, and I'm glad I'll get to hear Steve preach. Uh, for announcements, please check the announcements page that came with your login information. 
And once again, welcome. So good to, to have everyone joining us this morning. And would you now please join the Welch family who are offering our call to worship. Where is this Jesus, the one you call Messiah? Christ is risen. Christ is here among us. I do not see him. I don't believe you. Christ is risen. Christ is here among us. His body, his hands, and his feet. We are Christ's body. We are Christ's feet. In the world, where is Jesus now? We are going to going into the world to be the body of Christ. Let us go together. Let us partner with others. For we are the body of Christ. Let, Let us share the good news. Okay, Steve, you're on. I think the next thing is singing a hymn. Morning has broken, hymn number 258. <clears throat> morning please join with me now in a time of prayer as we come together to open the service god in the wake of easter's miracle we remain in awe of the power of your love to overcome all obstacles even death we exclaim alleluia and find joy in our knowledge of your presence in our lives though the world is anxious and we cannot come together in person. Bless this time and the technology that allows us to join one another in praise of you. Bless these screens and bless these speakers that create connection and soothe the pain of seclusion. Make this time together this morning dedicated to you, a time of peace, comfort, and reassurance for your frightened people. Amen. Amen. And now, our message for all ages. I can see a few uh, younger people with us, although we're, we all look very young at heart. Um, <laughs> I would like to ask 
if this is possible, and, and Dave or Cynthia could tell me if it's not, <laughs> I would like to ask the children or anyone else who feels really inspired to tell me about something that we know is real, but we can't see it or touch it. You might have to manually unmute yourself in order to be heard. Oh. Air. Air, right? We need it to breathe. We know it's there, but I can't do it. God. God. I like that. You get extra points. Mm -hmm. Are you saying magnetic? Magnetic fields. Oh, that is a really good one. I, I, I choose to believe other people who tell me those are real. I don't even know. <laughs> sound waves. Sound waves. That's a really good one. That's a really good one. Um, if you can hear me, then theoretically, there's sound waves coming out of your speakers. Or, and even out of my mouth. <laughs> Love. Love. Perfect. That is, that is, that is perfect. Gravity. Gravity. Right? Not just uh, force, it's the law. <laughs> All right, I got a gravity joke in, so I win. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the story that we're going to hear today um, from the Gospels is the story of Jesus and the disciples and a disciple specifically named Thomas. And Thomas, in the days after Jesus dies, doesn't believe it when his friends tell him that that Jesus came back. He doesn't believe that that Jesus was there and he needs proof. He needs to see it. He needs to touch Jesus and to know that he's really there because he has doubts. And I think we can all relate to that. Um, but Jesus comes back and he, he gives him the proof he needs but challenges him to believe even though proof might not always be there. And that's something that we call faith. We believe even though we can't always put our finger on it, we can't prove it, we believe anyway. And that is one of the, one of the hardest parts but of, of being a Christian and believing in God and God's love for us. But it's also one of the, one of the most powerful and amazing things, knowing that it's there and not needing any proof to know it. So I wanted to share this idea and this, a little bit of the story with you. And if you listen a little longer, you'll hear the passage from the Bible um, that tells Thomas's story. But if you wouldn't mind now joining with me in our, our prayer for all ages, and I don't know if we'll be able to hear each other, but I'll, I'll have faith that you're praying along with me. Thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you, God, for loving me. Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you, God, for loving me, even when I can't prove it. Thank you, God, for loving me, even when I can't prove it. Thank you, God, for loving everyone. Thank you, God, for loving everyone. Amen. Amen. Our hymn for all ages is All Creatures of Our God Now Sing. We're going to do three verses of it. They're printed in that, um, that display that's going to show up. And uh, it's in the All creatures of our God now sing. Alleluia, Alleluia. Oh, burning sun with golden green. Oh, silver moon with softer green. Oh, sweet praises. Oh, sing praises. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Oh, rushing wind with 
point so strong. Oh, clouds that sail in heaven long. Sing your praises, alleluia. Oh, rising morning, praise rejoice. Oh, lights of evening, find a voice. Oh, sing praises, oh, sing praises, alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. This morning's scripture, there's two scripture passages this morning. The first, Paul will read for us from 1 Peter verses one, uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. And in this, we hear more of that idea of faith and joy and, and, and love in God and through God, despite a lack of, of proof, despite... Uh, a lack of evidence. We know it, and we can rejoice in it. And you'll hear lots about the gospel passage in a few minutes. One Peter, chapter one, verses three through nine. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By His great mercy, He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, defiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who are, who are per, being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now, for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that, though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So ends the reading. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. And as I mentioned just a few minutes ago with the children, it's the story of Thomas and his doubts. But I urge you to recognize similarities between the life and experiences of the... Well, I urge you to see if maybe we can find ways to relate to the experiences of the disciples who are staying together but withdrawn and in, in a, little bit of, a little bit of fear this time of the story. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, 
Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my fingers in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you might have come, you might come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Here ends this reading from Holy Scripture. Amen. Amen. So, as I'll get into in just a second, this morning's um, preparation for this service led me, well, before I could get into the passage that we're reflecting on here this morning, I was drawn by something to another passage a passage a passage from the gospel of luke that that's challenging a gospel from the a passage from the gospel of luke that that i feel kind of sets a stage so let me read it and then i'll tell you why i was drawn to it A reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 57 to 62. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those in my home. Jesus said to him, no one puts a hand to the plow and looks back. is fit for the kingdom of God. This reading from the gospel of Luke is, is, is loaded with meanings. It's, it's loaded with meanings um, and, and messages and complicated theology, but it always, it always manages to draw forth from me the same visceral response. And that the same, the same feeling that, the same feeling bubbles to the surface every time I read it, and that is that sometimes Jesus asks too much. He seems to ask us, too much sometimes. It's too hard to do the things that he wants us to do. It's too hard to to be the things that he wants us to be. And I had the same reaction when I read it this morning. I was drawn to it because I because of that reaction.
I feel like the world right now is asking us a lot. The world we live in today is asking a lot of us as Christians, as people. Before I dive too deep into the scripture passage that is actually the focus for today, I'd like to show you a little bit of how the sausage is made, if you will, and give you a little glimpse behind the curtain into my process on Sunday mornings. I have a bad habit, you see. On the Sunday morning before I preach, I get up really, really, really early, like ludicrously early. <laughs> it's a bad habit. And I go over the, the sermon and the scripture passages and the service over and over and over again. Even with this, I still have moments during some services where I manage to fumble things so badly that I wonder if I'm not wasting my time. And yet I continue to do the same thing every Sunday morning before a service. There's nothing wrong with this review time. There's nothing wrong with getting up and trying to get my head wrapped a little bit further around this idea. Instead, the problem that comes out of this bad habit of mine is my tendency to make changes or to tweak the content that I've prepared in advance. And to do it at such an early morning hour before I've had enough coffee to think straight about anything. I'll add a joke here. I'll get rid of a joke there. I've been known to plan spontaneity. Never really works. This gets the, to be the most dangerous, though, when it comes to my ref reflection or my sermon. In the past, I've made corrections to my sermons. I've added insights and illustrations. I've even occasionally thrown everything out and started from scratch on Sunday morning. I do all of this in the morning of the service because I'm trying to ensure the best possible outcome. I'm trying to, to make the most meaningful points and connections But more than that, I want, to, I want to bring myself, the scripture, and the world that we're living in on that Sunday morning together one more time and be sure that I'm addressing all of you from this moment and not some distant, separate place. I got up this morning before the sun, before the roosters, if you will, and I realized that this morning would be no different. I didn't throw everything out. But I did get up at a ridiculously early hour and make changes. I even added some spontaneity. But I think more than anything, I came to be closer to Thomas as a result of this morning's reflection. And in some ways, I came to be closer to Thomas through that passage that I just read you, recognizing that Thomas probably felt like believing in that moment was almost too hard. The world outside of our windows today is a hard place. It's kind of, a, it's kind of scary. We're doing new things. We're we're hunkering down and avoiding one another to prevent the spread of just a horrible sickness. We're living through screens and speakers and microphones, and that accounts for a large part of our social interaction. Last night, Jackie and I, my wife Jackie, if uh, some of you maybe haven't met her, um, we were watching a live streamed concert, a benefit concert, dedicated to the people on the front lines of this COVID-19, this coronavirus battle. It was on the front lines of this illness that has us all sheltering in place. And it was a performance and an interview and a vignette. And we were given some really poignant meaningful glimpses of the people working so hard to keep us safe and to find a cure and to soothe and comfort those 
infected. And I think those vignettes and those interviews and those poignant moments must have been weighing on me in my sleep because I woke up feeling overwhelmed. And I have to admit that this feeling of being overwhelmed is something that I've had more in the past few weeks than I've been probably for a very long time before that. It's more than a concern about getting sick. It's the weight of, of, of the rest of life, of homeschooling my kids for the rest of the academic year. It's knowing if I'm doing that right. It's trying to determine how much concern to let through in my demeanor and my conversations. It's wrestling with fear. What is the world going to look like when all this is done? I don't know, and you don't need to answer, but I wonder how many of you have had thoughts like this, concerns or fears about what's happening, or where things are headed. And frustration, probably of equal measure, makes up a lot of my time as well. So concern and anxiety and fear and frustration and anger and cabin fever, and the list goes on and on and on. And yet when I woke up this morning, my intention, what I planned on doing when I went to bed last night, I intended to get up this morning and reflect on the Easter miracle because that's what we should be doing on this first Sunday, second Sunday of Easter time. We should be focusing on the miracle, this beautiful gift that God gave us through Christ's sacrifice. But being completely honest with you, my first thought after a sip of coffee this morning was not, how can I convey the perfection of God's love to these people today? It was, ugh, how am I going to keep my two-year-old from screaming while I try to share this uplifting news? And don't get me wrong, I wholeheartedly believe this news, this good news. I believe it with all of my heart and with all of my soul, but when I slumped out of bed, slid out of my pajamas and, and into the weight of the world this morning, I needed something more concrete. I needed proof. When we join the disciples in this morning's passage from John, we find them in a sort of shelter-in-place situation of their own. In the wake of Jesus' death at the hands of the Romans and and in some ways, the hands of their own leaders, the leaders of their own Jewish community, the disciples are hiding out, they're hiding out, with the doors locked and the windows shuttered for fear that they will be found and executed as well. They're living in a state of fear, hiding in their homes or in, in a home together. And it's in this time of fear that Christ comes to them and speaks to them and reassures them and comforts them and rekindles their buffeted faith in him and in his promises and in his love. But Thomas was not with them. I find it interesting that Thomas isn't with them. He's out in the world. And it is after coming into this space with his friends from the world, from the weight of, of things going on outside of that space, when he comes into this space and he's told of these things, he doubts. He's got reservations. His experience is too hard to correlate with this new information. When they had been feeling hope and love and inspiration, Thomas had been nervous and afraid for his life and unsure where to turn. Or at least that's what I imagine he was feeling. So when he was told of Christ's return, he looked at his friends with doubt, maybe a doubt that even sounded a little like contempt. And he said, I need proof. I'm not going to believe this until I can see it. Show me the man and show me the wounds. Then I will believe. Give me something real to see and to touch, and I will believe. I wonder if you find the promises of Easter have been a little harder to, to rejoice in. A slightly harder pill to swallow when we're, we're hit every day with more challenging news. A 
I wonder if maybe this moment is the, isn't the hardest you've had, but you've had other moments of doubt or challenge before when the real world seemed to be making its case a bit more believably than God, a bit more, a bit more concretely than our God that says, believe though you have no proof. I don't think you'd be wrong to have doubts. I hope you wouldn't because I have had doubts. But the story tells us that Christ does come to Thomas and gives him his proof, his concrete, tangible, touchable, embodied proof. And likewise, Christ comes to us with an embodied proof. And I stumbled onto this as I reflected on those challenging vignettes last night. Maybe the proof that Christ brings us doesn't come in the form of a spear wound or nail holes. Maybe it's not the cuts and punctures of a crown of thorns, because as powerful as those images are, they're not the ones that resonate with our lives today, not, not the way they would have with the lives of the disciples. Instead, Christ comes to us with other proof. We just need to open our eyes, believe, and we will see it. This is advice as much for me as it is for you. I told you just a few moments ago that Jackie and I had been watching this benefit concert last night and how its stories of the COVID crisis had weighed on me overnight and into this morning. And to be completely honest, they're still pulling on my heartstrings right now. But I think that along... I think that along with, and even in response to the hardest part of those stories of loss and illness and overwhelming odds, along with those things, God has given us some of the surest personification of Christ among us today. Because the horrible pain of sickness is being met by nurses and teachers and doctors and social workers and janitors and grocery store employees. And they are indeed the body of Christ personified for us. Sent that sent so that we can have our proof. If we just open our eyes and see it. If we witness to it here and now, and we choose or allow ourselves to believe it, we can witness to these bodies of work in our world. The, these bodies at work in our world, to the wounds that they carry, not wounds from weapons as Christ's body was inflicted with, but bruises and abrasions from masks and goggles, worn for extended, protracted periods of time as they sat at the side of our loved ones who we couldn't sit with. Not wounds from weapons, but hands cracked from washing so often because they're constantly contacting the ill and they need to maintain their own health to keep serving them. Not wounds from weapons, but the wasting effects of fatigue as these people wage an unending battle for our health, for our safety and for our security. We need only look and see and we will see, have our proof. I mentioned that I find myself feeling closer to Thomas today, and that was not where I initially intended to go this morning. Honestly, I was intending to focus on the last phrase in this morning's passage, gospel passage, that talks about the reason for including these miracles in John's, in John's gospel, that we may understand that Christ is the Messiah. But when I woke up this morning, and before that, even yesterday and the day before, as I continued to wrestle with parenting in this new reality, living in this new reality, I couldn't find myself stepping away from Thomas's story. I can relate to his doubt, to his desire to believe and his unwillingness to ignore the pain of the world. He couldn't put that down. It was part of his reality. 
I think more than anything, the story of Thomas seems to be giving me, and I think us, permission, permission to be wholly human, wholly physical creatures, wholly part of this amazing, scary creation that God has blessed us with, and wholly loved by God, not despite it, but because of it. So this is where the passage from Luke comes in for me. When Christ asks us to follow him, it seems as though he's telling us to set everything down, to discard our loved ones and those things that we find important, to set the realities of the world down and follow him at their expense. But I, I wrestle with this, and I, I, I think he's saying something so much more. He isn't saying we need to do this at the exclusion of the world and our lives, and instead we need to live first through the love that is following in his footsteps. And if we do this and we enter into all of those other concerns from a place of Christ's love, if we approach parenting and, 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 and our relationships, our jobs, and our passions, driven by the love that Christ has taught us, by doing so, we're not only living for ourselves, but not only meeting our needs, not only holding our own, li- not only holding our own lives, but we're holding other lives before ours. We're living for others, and in doing so, we become the proof of Christ that this world needs to see. We become that Easter miracle every day. So here's where I am now. As I wrestle with Easter in the context of this world today, I say, love God. And when you need it, you demand from God proof. But when you do this, you keep your eyes and your hearts and your minds open, and you will see that it's already there for you. The proof that the love of God is alive in the world today is in the love and the sacrifices of the people all around you. This is the good news that I found in this morning's scriptures. This is the good news that I find in this myriad of screens in front of me with all of your faces. God is the love that we share in the world. God is the love that's shared with us. And this truly is an Easter miracle. Hallelujah. Amen. So. we've come to the time in the service where we share with one another those things that we brought with us, those joys and those concerns, those things uh, that are holding our our shoulders down, the weight that's too much to carry alone, and those things that are bubbling up from our hearts that we can't help but share with one another. Is there anything that any of you would like to share this morning so that we might include it in, in in our congregational prayer? I would like to share something. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. I, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> um, I just, Kevin wanted me, my son Kevin wanted me to relay his thanks to everyone who has sent him notes and cards. Um, he's finding it a little difficult to answer, but he's trying to slowly answer people. But he really appreciates the mail he's gotten. Wonderful. Other joys or concerns this morning? I'd like to offer up a joy that uh, my mother is recovering at home from COVID-19. Wonderful. That is good news. I would like to keep uh, in in, uh, I pray as all the mill workers in Jay who were there the, when the uh, explosion occurred. Mm-hmm. Keep them in our prayers and uh, and hopes uh, that they go back to work real soon. And thank God that they they weren't hurt or killed. Absolutely. 
I'd like to mention, this is Guy speaking. I'd like to mention that I think that today's service has ironed out a lot of the problems that we have been having. The, uh, there have been a lot of people uh, that have tried in the background to get this thing to go smoothly. And I think today is a result of a lot of work in the background that made this thing flow well. I'm amazed at how well this is going. And we can, we can see Steve, hear Steve perfectly. We can see and hear our pastor perfectly. And the music is good. And I can see a whole bunch of faces. Uh, hallelujah. It's, um, we, we did it. I think we did it, boys and girls. Absolutely. I think it's a joy that I can see Archie with Brady. <laughs> Where is he? You can see him there. Oh, he's Okay, one last call. All right. One last call for prayers. Please join me in a moment of silent prayer, after which I will offer a pastoral prayer in response to those things you've shared and, and those things that you've chosen to share directly with God. Beloved Lord, Lord of new experiences, Lord of Lord of peace and comfort and calm, be with us despite the storm outside our doors. We reach for you. We call to you. We cling to you in this time of confusion, in this time of newness, in this time of rough growing edges. Give us comfort and peace as we face uncertain futures, give us, give us the knowledge of your presence in our lives. We would like to thank you for, for so many things. We would like to thank you for For Dave's mother, who is recovering from illness. We would like to thank you and recognize you in the attention that we, we need and we see and experience from our loving communities. We would like to thank you for this beautiful day and this time that we spend together, for the availability of technology that allows us to be together despite our distance. And you great things are truly possible. Yet as we offer thanks for these, these gifts and so many more that have gone unnamed. We also ask that you, you be with us in our challenging times. Specifically, we ask that you be with those workers from the mill in Jay, 
as they recover from the experience of an explosion. We ask you to be with us as as we face those unknown questions of how to proceed when we can't go to work or we can't go visit with our loved ones or we can't go to the grocery store without a mask and a line out the door. But more than anything, Lord, we ask you to be at our side, to make yourself known, to brighten our days with your presence. And we thank you for the gift of Christ's sacrifice, sacrifice for us, that we may know your love more perfectly. Let us now offer the words of prayer that Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us these debts, give us these, forgive, tripping over my own tongue here. Let me begin again, I apologize. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. (laughs) Well, on that note, I invite all of you as we listen to Katie play uh, the offertory music today, I invite you to consider how you will continue to contribute and support Standish Congregational Church financially while we can't meet in person. Your gifts may come uh, in many forms, uh, and we ask that you be as generous as you're able um, in this uh, new and uh, uncharted place. This morning's offertory will now be played. to recover from what was an awkward moment just a few moments ago. Go forth from this time that we have spent together this morning into the world, safely within your homes, in the knowledge that you are loved, 
You are loved by God and you are loved by your community. Go forth in knowledge that Christ's life was sacrificed, that we may know God's love more perfectly. And until we meet again, may God be ever at your side. Amen. 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 It was such a pleasure to hear Steve today. Uh, Katie's piano music was beautiful, came through beautifully. As Guy said, a lot of behind the scenes preparation. And um, I'm now going to unmute everyone.